Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dr. Julian Avoa. I'm, I'm from El Paso, Texas for uh, my international friends. I know that I had requested or invited uh, my friends from the United Kingdom and uh, from uh, all of Europe, Australia, New Zealand uh, to sign on. And so I wanted to talk about uh, meshes. Now, to clarify something, uh, I had gotten a question or a comment, are you going to talk about all types of meshes? And today I'm just going to talk about urethral meshes, specifically TVT and TOT, but the message related to meshes are the same messages related to abdominal hernia meshes, to the eShore permanent sterilization device. So I'm going to generalize my comment as far as meshes are concerned for any foreign body that exists in the human body. So that's what I want to talk about. Specifically, I want to talk about uh, vaginal meshes, excuse me, urethral meshes, and I'm going to generalize that term as well because TVT and TOTs, and I'll explain that in a moment because I know those that are already watching or interested in this subject matter already know what a TVT and TOT are. But I'm going to change it up a bit in my explanation and what I define as a TVT and TOT to make it uh, more appropriate and more factually correct. I heard that yesterday, factually correct, by a lecture that I was watching of four savants in the field of urogynecology that I was shocked in many, and, and, and enlightened in many time points, but shocked in many points as well as to their, their comments related to uh, urethral meshes and in general transvaginal meshes. So let me go and start out. Now, I've gotten a lot of information here. All of this information is available online, and I'm going to go ahead and put the tags available for each one. So don't scurry and think that you have to uh, rush out. I'm going to add these either to the line right now uh, um, to the opening uh, statement and commentary related to this, or I'm going to add it at the end to, uh, to, the, um, to one of my comments so that you can follow along. So let's talk about um, uh, a comment made by one of the savants. I don't really want to uh, call out anyone, so I'm just going to generalize the fact that I, I watched a, a video. It was a lecture commentary to uh, experts in the field who uh, place uh, urethral and trans, uh, transvaginal meshes in general. And I wanted to uh, just make some comments. One of the commentators, one of the doctors said, to be factually correct, uh, transvaginal meshes have not been banned by the FDA. And that is correct. Factually being correct, the FDA has not banned transvaginal meshes. What they did uh, state and prevented from happening was this. In order to get a particular product approved by the FDA for a particular uh, procedure, you must get FDA approval. It must be approved by the FDA and properly labeled by the FDA in order for uh, a particular device to be, uh, to be available, such as the Perigee uh, uh, mesh, for example. Here's the deal. If the, the reason why these devices, the transvaginal meshes, were pulled off the market or not allowed to be sold, let's be, again, not allowed to be sold, was the fact that they could not be proven to be safe and effective for the labeling that was associated with them. Here's what the shocking issue was from the, from, from the uh, video that I watched yesterday. The doctor, one of the savants, and I, can, I call it a savant because he's an expert in the field of urogynecology. One of the, uh, the experts, the professors, or the, the equivalent uh, thereof, that was giving a lecture to his fellows and very, um, a, a large number of them who were watching, is this. He said that although it's factually correct that transvaginal meshes are no longer uh, uh, available as a kit, for example, that doesn't mean that they're banned because the FDA does not have the authority, does not have the authority to tell doctors how to practice medicine. Basically, that was the concept. And that is true. So what is allowed is this. If a doctor feels 
that a particular type of material, for example, that's already approved for use uh, in the human body is appropriate for that particular surgery, that doctor can go ahead and use that material, what's called off-label, and use it in a patient. Here's what I don't understand. Why would a doctor that uh, has so many years of experience and already knows that similar devices made out of similar material was not proven to be safe and effective in the human body and for that reason was not allowed to be sold anymore by, by, uh, or approved by the FDA. Why would you put that device in the human body? Well, if you have informed consent from the patient, obviously you're allowed to do it. But I don't understand how a, a, a hospital or a university program or a residency program, any type of program like that, that's associated with, with this particular doctor or a doctor like, like him, would allow that to, to occur, would give privileges for that, would say, listen, you can't prove that meshes in the vagina are safe and effective. They've been, uh, they can't be sold any longer by the, uh, by the FDA, with the FDA approval, because they haven't been proven as be safe and effective. But it's okay for you to go ahead and modify a mesh. Hi, Big Sue. A modify a mesh, Wendy, hi. Modify a mesh and then place it in the human body with the probable same potential risks and complications uh, as these kits, which were designed specifically for that reason. So you're gonna modify a piece of mesh and think you're gonna have better outcome or potentially lower risks as compared to these kits that were specifically designed for that particular uh, procedure and have failed to show anything. Uh, in, in all sincerity, the arrogance of such a comment boggles my mind because I would never place a device such as that. Again, I'm an individual, I'm a doctor. I would never place a device such as that knowing the, uh, of the potential risks of it, knowing what the FDA already said about other devices. And it wasn't just one device. You're talking about more than 10 devices that couldn't prove their safe and efficacy their safety and efficacy and we're not allowed to be used anymore. And yet we're looking at hundreds of thousands of lawsuits related to transvaginal meshes because they weren't found to be safe and effective. Okay, that was my point number one. Yes, technically speaking, transvaginal meshes have not been pulled off the market, but only um, basically fools would be uh, uh, careless enough to put these devices in the human body knowing that of the potential risks associated with them. Uh, first of all, do no harm. And if you're, unless, unless you're willing to cause potential catastrophic harm to a patient, why would you modify a mesh when it hasn't been proven to be safe and effective? Because of your experience? I'm sorry. Experience doesn't cut it, especially with the medical legal environment that we're in. But just to say, put that aside for a moment, how could you convince someone that, that, that you know more with no, nothing to back it up with? So, um, another uh, point that uh, related to this lecture that I watched yesterday, again, I'm generalizing, is the concept of the definition of a TVT, and now we're going to go with TVT and TOT. I describe uh, these urethral meshes in the manner in which they're put in the body. Now, that's not technically how you're supposed to describe them. When you're looking at TVT, and you've looked at my other lectures, or my, excuse me, on my other commentaries. It's not a lecture. This is commentary. This is commentary. The m fundamental issue, the fundamental point is that you have to talk to your own doctor about what we're talking about today to get a, a well-rounded and informed consent from your doctor and not me because I'm not your doctor, but I am a doctor that has a little bit more experience uh, as far as pulling in all of the aspects of a particular subject rather than tunnel vision and one, because you understand what's, not, what's going to happen? If we pull urethral meshes off the market, it will be a catastrophic to the bottom line of a lot of urogynecologists because they no longer have the experience to go back and put in biological uh, 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 implants or the old school to go back and do uh, birch procedures and those procedures that are teachers told, taught us how to do. So they're going to have to be put, placed back on a learning curve and many doctors don't have the time, the effort, or th really 
they really don't want to do that. So if you pull urethral meshes off the market, you're going to be catastrophic to the bottom line of your, a lot of urogynecologists because they simply don't have the experience to go back and do the traditional uh, methods of uh, birch procedure, for example. So let's go back to definitions. Technically, TVT stands for tension-free vaginal tape. TVT, tension-free vaginal tape. I say TVT as transvaginal tape because that's the method is with this place. You, you enter through the vagina and you place the tape around the urethra. Okay, And I call TOT transobturator tape because you have to go in through the obturators to be able to place it and it's not directly through the vagina, it's from, from away from the vagina and placed under your urethra. So I don't want to get into all of the all of the description anatomical. I'm just going to stick to one point and why I, I go back and describe it TVT as transvaginal tape because the term tension-free tape is a fallacy. It is a fallacy that you do not have tension related to tension-free uh, vaginal tape. Why is that? And this was another co comment made by the savants in the video that I saw yesterday. They described, well, you put, the, you put the mesh in and it just works. It just works by placing the mesh in. You don't have to secure the mesh in the body. It just works. But there was no description and discussion of how it works. Okay, when you place mesh in the body, it causes a foreign body reaction. That foreign body reaction causes an inflammatory response. That inflammatory response causes the tissue around it to scar in place. When the tissue around it scars in place, it starts to modify the position of the mesh and starts to put tension on it. So you no longer have a tension-free vaginal tape. It's under tension. Here is another fallacy. The idea that there are doctors that are, that are all doctors that have a complication related to a TVT, put it in too tight. No, that's not what happens. Very many doctors appropriately place uh, TVTs and TOTs, but what happens is the foreign body inflammatory response under the autoimmune inflammatory syndrome induced by adjuvants or age effect caused this inflammatory response, caused this scarring effect, caused the, 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 ta the, the tapes, the meshes to pull and constrict tissue around it. So TVTs and TOTs are not tension free. They will eventually cause a scarring effect and that's what happens there. So I will ref I refuse to call TVTs tension-free vaginal tapes because they're, they're not tension-free. They're specifically designed to cause an inflammatory response, to cause scarring that cause tension. Okay, and if you can uh, measure the tension or the lack thereof, then maybe you, w you should be allowed to call it a tension-free tape, but I don't, by the, by the way that they're designed, they're not designed to be tension-free. Okay, so I've got some uh, articles that I wanted to go over, and I decided that I was going to um, uh, read these in, in a backwards direction. Um, first of all, why is there so much confusion related to TVTs and TOTs? Again, I'm only going to speak of your ure urethral meshes today, but the concept of problems and complications is the same as with abdominal hernia meshes, inguinal uh, meshes. That's, the, that's all the same. Why? Because the materials are almost always the same. Polypropylene, plastic mesh, non-absorbable, permanent devices not meant to be removed from the human body. So if you're watching and you're saying, well, how is this applicable to the hernia mesh that I have? If you have an infection of your hernia mesh, if you have chronic scarring from your hernia mesh, if you have chronic pain from your hernia mesh, then you have the same problems as the transvaginal and transobturator meshes, or the, uh, TV, uh, excuse me, the trans TVTs, TOTs, and transvaginal meshes, all right? And the rectocele meshes as well. 
They're all the same. They all have the problem. Or Eshore, which is made out of polypropylene as well, or pl uh, plastic. Oh, excuse me, it's, it's made out of plastic. It's a different type of plastic, but it's very similar to the polypropylene meshes that we're talking about today. So how is it possible that there are still patients that are getting TBTs and TOTs placed in their bodies? It's because they're being recommended by their doctors. And these doctors are basically using antiquated information to promote a particular subject and get informed consent from antiquated information. So basically, they're not getting informed consent. I pulled this off of the, uh, the internet just as a description of what a TOT and TBT were. And it seems to be very nice explanation that it has, it can be placed in 30 minutes and it has a 90% efficacy. Uh, but in these two pages, it doesn't talk about any potential complications. So if a person goes on the internet and downloads some information on uh, bladder slings, on the TBT and TOTs, it, this sounds like, oh, this is all uh, uh, roses. This is a great device. No, no problems. 90% effective. Better than the traditional method. Oh, but where is the information related to pain? Where is the um, uh, information related to erosion of the mesh? Where is the uh, information related to pain with intercourse? Where is that? Hi, Rose House. Hi, everybody. So I'm sorry I'm not reading all the names that are going up. So here's, here's a... Here's a very nice one, and this is for, I assume, it's out of, out of uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, this one is from the Oxford University Hospitals. And again, I'm going to provide the link so you can read along. This one, I believe, is, this one's uh, 16 pages long? Let me see. Yeah, it's about 16 pages, seven, 16 pages long. It's 16 pages long, talking about... TBT for stress incontinence. TBT for stress incontinence. And it's very informative. It does uh, pretty much explain TBTs in general. But I wanted to highlight one important thing and let's talk about that. So let's get, let's talk about the elephant in the room for a minute. Okay. Let's talk about that. And I, hopefully that I highlighted it because I'm hoping that I, I mean, I did a lot of reading. Ah, oh, here we go. I didn't highlight it, but I found the page. Okay. Number one that was kind of shocking to me was the idea of thrombosis. It describes a deep venous thrombosis occurring in four to five out of a hundred people. I think that that's a, that might be a typo, but nevertheless, that means that um, one out of 20 women will suffer a deep venous thrombosis, which is a blood clot in the leg. Those things are, can be lethal to patients. So one out of 20 has a potential risk of, a potential risk of serious complications with a blood clot passing to the lungs or to the brain and causing death. Uh, who would want to go under an, uh, a procedure like that? But I'm not sure if that's a typo. They have to go back and review that one. But here is the, the commentary that I wanted to talk about. Hi, Janet. Hi, Jean. Hi, Deanna. Uh, Mesh exposure, that is on page seven. And it says here, the tissue where the tape has been inserted through the vaginal wall may not heal properly or may become infected. Let me tell you, anything that you put in through the vaginal wall potentially or almost inevitably, inevitably will become infected for some, no matter how careful you are about sterile technique. And that the mesh may be felt by your partner during sexual intercourse. This may occur in one in 10 women. All right, so let's go back. You're sitting there with your doctor and you're going over informed consent. And your doctor says, this thing is nothing but roses and gravy, okay? Depending on what you like. You like roses or you like, you like food? I'm not sure. Don't mean to be facetious in any way, but let's talk about that. And then your doctor tells you there's nothing wrong with this. It's very, very safe and effective. There's very, very, very few complications. But this paper, again, from the Oxford Hospitals, again, I'm going to provide a link, universe, Oxford uh, uh, University Hospitals, an NHS Foundation Trust, states, for the record, this may occur, the mesh may be felt by your partner during sexual intercourse. This may occur in up to one in 10 women. Page seven, mesh exposure. So you have a 10% chance 
of having this mesh erode into your vagina where you can't have sex anymore. Who told you that? Who advised you as a mesh uh, person that got mesh placed in her vagina around her urethra? Who told you that you had a 10% or a 1 in 10 chance that sometime during that placement you were going to have that mesh potentially erode through your, uh, your vagina and so that your partner could feel it? What is the potential risk that the mesh could erode into your bladder, into your urethral neck, or into the bladder? I'll get to that in a little bit. But here is like nonchalant. Here is a 16-page basically explanation of TVT. And they just put there, oh, there's a 1 in 10 chance that your partner will feel this mesh because it will erode right through. That is astounding that anyone would ever want to have a place have a mesh placed in their uh, in their around the urethra in the vagina if there's a one in ten chance that you could end up having it erode so that your partner could feel it or you couldn't have sex anymore now mind you once it erodes into the vagina it's it can be permanently contaminated that means that recurrent urinary tract infections again one of the most common issues recurrent urinary tract infections recurrent uh, episodes of erosion even if you try to sew it back up even if you take out that that mesh even if you do that at the portion you can have potential problems and recurrence of infection recurrence of scarring and pain the inability to have intercourse who told you that who advised you? I go to the, uh, to the mesh sections, and as of yesterday, I know that I read at least one story where a person had a mesh place recently. Were you advised, and mesh patients that are in the mesh groups, were you advised of these partic particular uh, potential risks of erosion that cause can cause permanent problems, especially now with inform now that we know so much about it? Uh, basically, I'm I'm talking uh, over and over and over again about the same thing, but it's important. It's very important to go over and talk about the fallacies of what my colleagues are, are saying to their patients to get them to get these, these TBTs and TOTs placed. Here's another one from the, um, the, it appears to be the John Radcliffe Hospital, Oxford. I think we're talking about the UK again. Oh yeah, it says UK uh, Referral Center. Again, I'll provide the links for all of these, but it says here, John Radcliffe Hospital, Oxford. First paragraph. The mid-urethral tension-free vaginal tape, TVT procedure, is a popular treatment for stress urinary incontinence. Vaginal mesh erosion following TVT has a reported rate varying from 0.3 to 23%. So I think what patients are being told is that they have a 1 in, in 300 chance that they're going to have a complication. But in reality, they have a 1 in 5 chance of having a complication. That's how patients are being sold on the idea of a urethral mesh for urinary stress incontinence. I'm almost certain that that's what's going on. So this was a study done way back in 2005-2010 evaluation, so it's more than 10 years old. But I wanted to go through a series of what's been going on since 2005 because the, the, the misinformation, disinformation, is we're still quoting a 1% complication erosion rate when in reality we know that it's, it's between 20 and 30%. But here's a, a perfect example of back in 2005 where it was already being stated that it could be as high as 23%. So back in 2005 for the ladies that had uh, TBT, TOTs placed, well, TBTs placed in 2005, were you told that the potential risk of, of um, erosion was only 1 in 300 or like non-existent or were you told that it was 1 in 5? That's what I'd like to know. Here is um, the next one. This was in 2009. Transopterator tape compared to 
tension-free vaginal tape, which again, I disagree that there's anything, anything uh, that actually is actually tension-free. But let's let's go with, with what it called tension-free vaginal tape for stress incontinence. And what I highlighted or put in purple here is what the note I wanted to describe. On vaginal exam in a group of 199 women, on vaginal exam, the tape was palpable in 68 women, which was 80% of the women, in the trans obturator tape group, and for 24 uh, women, which was 27% of the women, and the TVT group. And so this is what I talked about last time related to transvaginal meshes and meshes in general. Once you place a mesh in the body, it's meant to be, there's meant to be scar tissue that forms around it. When you form scar tissue around anything, that area becomes sensitized to pressure. Okay. So, and think of any, any part of your body where you have a scar. Sometimes when you feel it, you can barely feel anything. And sometimes if you touch a scar, it's very, very sensitive. Well, if you place a TVT or TOT, the area where the, the, the mesh is placed becomes sensitized. If you put, you can feel it, you can put pressure in that area. And sometimes you can actually palpate the mesh. I have been able to palpate the mesh, especially in TVTs. So when you palpate this mesh and you put pressure on it, that hurts the patient. So if you can palpate a mesh and it hurts the patient, not only does it hurt her when she uh, urinates, but it can hurt her when she has intercourse. Again, so the question in this study was, uh, what, was the, uh, what was the potential issues related to a palpable mesh causing long-term problems? And what they found was that even though 80% of the time uh, you could feel it in a TOT and 27% of the time you could feel it in a TVT. It was palpable. What they said was that after, uh, after review that both of them had about the same level of, of uh, issues or potential issues five years out. Uh, here's the issue. They described a... Um, Issue of bladder perforation with one type of, um, his, historically, with one type of um, uh, mesh as being as high as 15%. That is extraordinarily high, a bladder perforation related to a, uh, to a bladder, uh, excuse me, to a, uh, to a mesh. So it said, bladder perforation also was found to be the most commonly reported complication of TVT in studies of transobturator tape compared to the uh, transobturator tape compared to the TBT. So the bladder perforation was about 3%. So here we have already uh, a, a 10 times higher rate of complications if you were told that it was 1 in 300. This is closer to 3%. And so that's 1 in 30 women could have a bladder perforation related to this. And in this particular study, uh, the they found that the tape was palpable and tender, that means it caused discomfort, in about 13% of the women in this particular study, and that there was an extrusion, that means that it actually perforated through the vagina, into the vagina, uh, at 6%. That's extraordinarily high. We, we don't normally manage patients with complication rates this high for any type of procedure. If we do a procedure, such as suppose we had a special technique for a cesarean section, and this special technique for cesarean section had a complication rate of 6%, we would not be allowed to do that procedure anymore. We'd have to go back to, to, to the traditional way of doing a cesarean section. And that's exactly why. But why is this allowed to happen? Because if you get enough Experts, if you get enough urogynecologists to say this is a great idea, then it becomes the standard of care. And if it becomes the standard of care, everybody starts to do it, even though it has a catastrophic outcome. So how they justified an evaluation of this in this particular study was the, 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 what they call the objective evaluation of quality of life um, by the, um, by the IIQ-7. So I went ahead and I downloaded the uh, urinary uh, distress inventory short form, the, ID, uh, the UDI-6, 
and the incontinence impact questionnaire short form, the IIQ-7. Again, I'll try to provide an explanation. So what they, what they were basing quality of life from putting these meshes in were based on these two types of short forms. These, these, well, maybe longer forms, but basically the general questions were asked of before you had the mesh placed to after you had the mesh placed. And here's the deal. N neither one of these questionnaires ha asks any question related to uh, pain with intercourse or foreign body reaction, especially inducing autoimmune reactions. The in incontinence impact questionnaire short form, the um, IIQ-7, and I'm just going to try to run through this very quickly. Ability to do household chores. F next question, physical, react, uh, re um, physical uh, recreation such as walking, swimming, or other exercises. Number three, entertaining activities. Number four, ability to travel by car or bus more than 30 minutes from home. Number five, participation in social activities outside your home. Number six, emotional health such as nervousness, depression, etc. And, num and number seven would be feeling frustrated. No questions related to, hey, did you have pain related to an erosion of this vaginal mesh? Did you have pain with intercourse related to this uh, uh, vaginal, transvaginal, uh, this TBT, TOT? And the urinary stress short form, uh, the, it does ask the question at the last question, pain or discomfort in your lower abdominal, pelvic, or genital area. But since it's one, two, three, four, five, six, since it's only one of six questions, you could hit number three on this and still the numbers would be so different as improvement as far as the efficacy of the device that it would skew any information. So basically what I'm saying is that we have never denied the fact that the TBTs and TOTs are effective in preventing stress incontinence. But what, what we're denying is the fact that they're safe once you place them. And what you're justifying and what you're negating in, in doing a, a study like this is that when you ask a questionnaire that doesn't ask the right questions about how you're feeling after a, a, a mesh is placed, you're basically lying to yourself and you just wasted everybody's time by writing this paper. You just wasted everybody's time and you're disseminating information that, that people do not understand what, what's really associated with a problem. The problem is the, the, the chronic inflammatory response, the pain associated with the mesh, the inability to, 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 to have normal urinary function afterwards, the inability to have intercourse uh, normally uh, after that. That's what we're talking about. You need to come up with a questionnaire that asks those questions in order for that information to be valid. That's what needs to be ch uh, changed. Here we go to 2012. We're getting closer to now uh, what we're talking about. Um, and again, that one, that one that I showed you was in the Green Journal for the United States. Now, the Green Journal is one of two uh, Bibles as far as, as doctors going for references. Now, I could pull something out of an, of an obscure uh, journal and say, hey, I read this in this journal. But the green journal and the gray journal here in the United States are the gold standard. It's like the Lancet, for example. It's like uh, something from the uh, American Medical Association. Uh, the equivalents there in, to, to, um, a, in Europe as well. So here we go uh, again out of the green journal. Or from uh, for this is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecology, Obstetrics and Gynecology. I'm sorry, February 2012, and they're talking again about to compare the efficacy of uh, tension-free vaginal tape to obturator tape. Now, first of all, we're going to have to tell you that yeah, definitely uh, the, there's going to be um, serious issues with both type, but. Um, Apparently, the, the issues most commonly associated, let's go ahead and, and just sample right through these. Again, page after page of great, seemingly great information. And this is, this is amazing to me on this particular page that I read. 
there are actually doctors that repeated a transvaginal transobturator TBT or TOT on a patient. Why would you ever repeat a procedure that has such a high risk of complications? And yet, I'm again, I'm wondering what what was told to the patient. And again, as with everything, the trans obturator tapes apparently have much higher complication rates than the trans, the tension free vaginal tapes. So for all of those that got trans obturator tapes placed, were you told that they have a much higher risk of complications as, opposed, as compared to the tension free vaginal tapes? I'm not sure you were told. And amazing to me that they would have, the, they, the doctors would actually repeat these procedures on patients knowing what the potential uh, complications, because by 2012, we already knew what was going on. These were horrible devices for, for, uh, for a significant number of patients. So moving on, uh, here's one, and again, I'll have to put the link on here. This one's a little hard to read. It says, Risk factors for mesh erosion after vaginal sling procedures for urinary incontinence. This is a 2014. And here they say, um, this was a study with 566 women who underwent a tension-free vaginal tape procedure and 873 women who underwent a trans obturator tape procedure. Uh, most common issue, most common complication was groin pain. Hi, Loretta. The rate of mesh erosion in the TOT group was 4.7, and the rate of mesh erosion in the TVT group was 3.5. Extraordinarily high, but what they were talking about in the post-operative period, mesh erosion occurred in an extraordinarily high group, 67.2 in the TOT and 32.8. So here's where we go with the idea that when your doctor tells you that the, 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 the rate of mesh erosion is only 1 or 2 percent, they're not looking at the most recent information. The most recent information suggests that it's between 25 and 30 percent. This one had a very high with a TOT of 67.2 in the post-operative period. But the fact of the matter is, if you want to just um, generalize it, that's what we can talk about is around 25 to 30 percent. But here's what, here's what really, really set me off when I read this part. In conclusions, it said, mesh erosion following vaginal sling procedures is a frustrating complication with relatively low incidence. What are you talking about? Relatively low incidence. If you're talking about in the post-operative period of 40 of, of 67.2 after a TOT and 20, and 32.8 after a TBT, but the, uh, the, the overall rates of erosion were 4.7 in the TOT and 3.5 in the TBT. So one, Let's, let's just round it up to 5%. So one out of 20 women in the TOT group was having a mesh erosion. Again, once you have a mesh erosion, it's, you have to deal with chronic infection rates, chronic pain, and the inability to remove the, the mesh once it's been placed. How could you describe it as relatively low incidence? That's, that is sugarcoating a, a, a paper. And again, then that's basically what you're doing. You're sugarcoating a paper when you come up with this. And then I went and I found a Canadian study, because these were uh, uh, most of these were in the United States, but a Canadian study that was published in 2015, uh, transobturator tape versus retropubic tension-free vaginal tape for stress incontinence, a five-year safety and effectiveness outcome following a randomized trial. So the... Uh, the um, Hypothesis of it was that TOTs uh, were associated with palpable uh, palpable mesh at 80% and 26%, 27% on the TBT. Again, if the mesh is palpable, 
that area is sensitized and very difficult to have intercourse. So if you could have up to an 80% chance that you've got a mesh in your, in your, around your urethra and you may not be able to have intercourse, were you advised of that by your doctor? I don't think so. I don't think, and again, this is 2015. So this is getting close to the date where some of the patients in the mesh group are describing that they had their, their meshes placed. By 2015, we already knew how bad these devices were. Okay, we already knew. And I just, like I said, I, I, it took me 15 minutes, but I got uh, study after study after study of, of erosion rates and issues with these. This particular one um, was from the um, Malaysia, again, all over the world. There was no different. They were de describing the differences in the filaments because some doctors, some doctors claim, oh, this is a different type of mesh. This is a different type of mesh. It's, it's better than what you had before. It's better than what we've had before. It's not going to cause the same problems. Okay, so like polypropylene mesh versus moly, uh, moly filament, uh, monofilament meshes. It's all the same. Someone asked me the question about hernia meshes. Mesh is mesh. Mush is mush. S is S. Okay, so basically, uh, the, we're, you're looking at a complication rates or uh, the uh, vaginal erosion rates of between 14.1 versus 30, 31.4. Again, one in three women has an erosion or potential complication with placing a urethral mesh. And this one was 2019. 2019 describing uh, the, um, and this one was International Urogynecology Journal, 20, published in 2020, but it was from a 2019, uh, received in 2019. So basically it comes down to this, urethral uh, mesh erosion was seen in 63 patients out of 140. Uh, our, re our research produced 931 articles of which 20 articles, 198 patients were included in our review. Urethral mesh erosion was seen in 63 patients, 32%, across all of the studies. So basically, one out of three. So here's where I keep hearing about uh, lawyers getting involved. They do quote a 30% complication rate. There's another one that says 32%. So were you told when you had a, vag a, a trans uh, attention-free vaginal tape or trans obturator tape or transvaginal mesh or erectile uh, 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 seal mesh placed, were you told that there's a potential complication rate of 30%? I'm not talking about just erosion, I'm talking about everything. And if you want to keep adding everything with the autoimmune responses, the Asia effect, uh, the, the scarring that can, or the, the erosion into the bladder, uh, potential scarring into the pelvis, uh, the inability to have intercourse, were you told that it's greater than 30%? No, you weren't. I'm pretty sure of it. Here's a, I believe that this is from, um, from uh, drugs.com. And again, this is, a, uh, this is not a, a study. This was basically uh, an explanation of what's going on with bladder sling complications. And I liked it because this, is a, this was not a doctor that, that uh, critiqued this, but basically... Um, did a pretty extensive evaluation of 20 studies. And I wanted to say one thing because I hear, I, I read this and it was one, th a comment of a, a patient after a mesh was placed. a uh, urethral or bladder sling recipient. Quote, unquote, I was in terrible pain. My pelvic area was on fire. Sex was out of the question because it hurt so bad. I was getting urinary tract infections, UTIs, on a regular basis. That's from Christy Hammond, a bladder sling recipient, and this was uh, presented in drugs.com. Again, I'll give you the link. So, so here's the deal. You've got, you still have, the reason why these devices have not been pulled off the market is because the FDA depends on 
a consensus from the experts. And if the experts say, the urogynecologist, urologist, and gynecologist say that in general, these devices are not only very safe, but very effective. The FDA will pretty much accept that as, as gospel. And if that's the case, that's why these devices are no are still on uh, available. That's why they're still available. As comparison to Eshore, Bayer felt that it was too much of a um, of a liability to continue offering that device. It never took it. It was never banned by uh, by and, and and required for a recall or taking it off the market. That was an economic decision made by Bayer to pull Eshore off the market. That's the same thing that needs to, would probably need to apply here is that economically it wouldn't be, uh, effective, excuse me, uh, cost effective for companies that provide these slings to still be providing them because you're not going to get a resolution from the FDA and I'm not sure what's going to happen in Europe related to it either. Okay. If you're looking for your government to make changes, it can only occur is if you put the spotlight on the doctors that are putting them in. And the spotlight must occur by challenging them to the informed consent. Did you give me the proper informed consent related to this device that you put in my body? If you didn't, then we have a problem. If you didn't, is that sanctionable by your medical society? That's how you're going to get these doctors to, to stop using these devices because they're going to keep saying, well, as long as it's on the market, I'm going to keep using it. Okay. And the only, and, and it's not going to be pulled off the market because there's a catch 22. If the doctors say that it's safe and effective, then it's going to stay on the market. And it's, and the, and the manufacturers are not going to pull it off the market because the doctors say that it's safe and effective. So who, who has always been the gatekeeper? It's always been the doctors. So you have to put the spotlight on the doctors. And as I said before, the, the four, uh, the four savants that I watched on the video yesterday, they were all in agreement that, um, that there was a place for these devices as superior to biological, uh, dev implants such as, uh, uh, cow or pig or implants or cadaver. And I know that sounds really, ooh, you know, but it, at least it's biodegradable, uh, devices and they, they felt that these were superior to traditional, for example, birch procedure, which is the traditional method for uh, supporting or elevating the bladder. And why? Because they said, well, there's less complications as far as failure is concerned. But they don't, they didn't address the complications of uh, inflammatory response, foreign body reaction, autoimmune reactions, the Asia effect. They didn't, they, no study has addressed this. All of these studies that I gave you, all of this information that I, that I, did I pulled off right now, not a single one talks about foreign body reaction. Oh, I think the last one did. I'm sorry. Uh, that was the most interesting. Uh, let me see if it's true that I, ah, yes, the only one, 2019, maybe, maybe finally we're going to start talking about it. This one, the role of endoscopic management and synthetic sling mesh. First line introduction to hypothesis. Foreign body erosion is now recognized as a major long-term complication following previous incontinence surgery. So there it is. The, the first and only study that I read that actually talked about foreign body in the first line. And that's what's going on. When you're told that there's a low risk of complications related to any type of mesh, there is no low risk of complications. They all have, it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to somebody that one to 2% uh, risk is low, well then they're going to push that, you know, they're going to push that message. But when you're looking at being on the other side of that, where you're the one or 2% or more likely the 20 to 30%, okay, uh, that, that's way too high. So here's the message. Is it, are you going to put yourself in the one or 2% where you might have just one complication, which is the erosion mesh, for example, or are you more likely to be in the 10, 20 or 30% where this can potentially be almost a death sentence for you as far as your life, changing your life. Okay. 
You may be walking around, but you're never going to be the same. That's what we're talking about here. Is it a, an emotional death sentence? Is it, is it a, is it a pelvic re related death sentence? Do you still have the same relationship that you had with your children? Do you still have the same relationship that you had with your husband or boyfriend? Did, did this lead to a divorce? Did this lead to a separation? Did this problem with a mesh lead to those things? Has it debilitated you? Have you now developed fibromyalgia, chronic pain syndrome, chronic pelvic pain, the inability to have intercourse? Has that happened to you? And that's what we're talking about. And we can't just blame men as urogynecologists and urologists and, well, maybe urolo urogynecologists, urologists, and uh, the general gynecologist. In gynecology and in the United States and OBGYN, more than 50% are now women. So women doctors are, are also pushing the same fallacy message. So the only thing that I can tell you is to download these types of, of, of um, reports, these type of, of um, studies. You know what, what really pisses me off? I'm sorry. What really pisses me off? is that most of the studies that are of any good are not available free. Uh, the, the reason that a lot of these studies I was able to get and I, put, I, I chose ones that were free is because I put myself in your position. So was I going to pay $30 to pull a report which may be difficult for me to read because I'm, you know, I'm putting myself in your place that I'm not a doctor? And most people are, going, are not going to do that. They're not going to spend $30 to read a, a paper uh, by an obscure, uh, well, not necessarily obscure, even the, uh, ACOG, for example. They're not going to spend $30 to read a, a study, uh, especially when the study in the title is so, it's, it's such a bed of roses. Like, it doesn't make it sound like there's anything wrong, that anything went wrong in the study. That's the other thing that really upsets me is that the, the lay person doesn't know where to go for information, and if the information is available, they don't have the money to pay for study after study after study. If they want to get 10 studies, they're going to have to have to spend $300 because each report costs around $30. I got ones that were free, and that's what I wanted to post. But of all the studies that were done, the majority of research and pu uh, publishing and uh, on, on studies are not free. Doctors will submit their, their publications for, uh, uh, the research for publications, and then in order for someone else to read that, you're gonna have to pay for it. So that's another uh, obstacle related to these issues. So, as usual, as every time that I've said, meshes have potential serious complications, serious risks. And are there patients that might benefit from a mesh? Of course there are. But are they properly informed about the potential risks? That's what I'm saying. If you don't know what you're agreeing to, you're not properly informed. If you don't know what you've agreed to, that's potentially a, a medical legal, a medical ethical issue of medical battery. Okay, that's what we face as doctors and we are ignoring our responsibility. So anyway, I, thank you so much for watching today. I hope this has helped out. I will go back and I will add a link to each one of my, uh, uh, each one of these so that you can go back and read it if you want so that you have something to review. And I hope it's been helpful. Thank you so much for watching. God bless everybody. Have a great day. Take care.